Well, hey, everyone. As he mentioned, my name is John Alexander. I work at a church called Eagle Brook, and I love being here. I do, because I think if you peel back the layers of both Eagle Brook and Westbridge, there's a lot of similarities, a lot of like-minded DNA, a, a passion and a commitment to reach people who are far from God. And I do love Jeremiah. Um, he's a good friend. We even had coffee and breakfast this week and just, just always great to catch up. Thanks for being here. I'm sure you're tired after attending the Taylor Swift concert, right? All of you, along with the, you know, however many thousands of people were there. Um, but again, we, we share a similar DNA at this church. And when it comes to people who are Christ followers, if you peeled Christ followers back. I know that's maybe a little gross, but if you kind of looked inside people who consider themselves Christ followers, there should be a proof of a Christ-like life. Our relationship with Christ because of the Spirit of God flowing through us should produce a life that, that looks similar to one another and set apart from the world. Now, Scripture refers to this difference, this proof, as fruit. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. When the Spirit of God is working in our lives, our lives should look similar to one another and be characterized by these fruits love, joy, peace, patience kindness, goodness, faithfulness, just to name a few. Now the problem, the problem, even for those who've followed Christ for quite some time, our lives don't always produce this kind of fruit. I mean, who can have patience when the three-year-old keeps writing with marker on the walls of your home? Who, who can be kind when the driver refuses to zipper merge that other driver? Who can produce self-control? When there are rampant temptations to eat more, to look more, to buy more. I mean, who can, who can truly experience joy when your parents are struggling with dementia or maybe a downward health spiral? Who is able to remain faithful and steadfast when the chaos of life just swirls around us? The answer, no one can at least on their own, not without the help of an outside, otherworldly source, not without the help of Jesus, but I've seen it with my own eyes. People who have every right to be angry, to be out of control and mean, and yet something better, this fruit, this proof of life emerges despite their circumstances. And so the question today is, how do you know what kind of fruit your life is producing and ensure it's producing the right kind. Well, one of the ways to find out is to reflect on how you act during a crisis or crucible moment. In 2018, five of us were on a flight back from a conference in Southern California when about 10 minutes from landing in Minnesota, a massive snowstorm enveloped the Twin Cities. Now you might remember that storm. It was April 14th and it was hashtag Snowmageddon. Okay, do you remember this one five years ago? After circling for a few minutes, okay, we're just above this storm. They said we couldn't land. So eventually we were diverted to Fargo. Now we didn't wanna stay two nights in Fargo. We didn't wanna stay one minute in Fargo, no offense, but... But we mustered up the courage. Once we landed in Fargo, we mustered up the courage or maybe foolishness to rent a car and drive straight from Fargo into the eye of the storm back in Minnesota. Now, being millennials, TJ, my friend, couldn't resist recording Instagram, storing most of our journey from this point. And so I still have that video. I want you to see just a couple minutes of this. Take a look. Bad news is we're in Fargo. The good news, I think they have Burger King here. All right, so we were in California and we flew back home, circled the Minneapolis airport. Too much snow, too much wind, so now we're in Fargo. So we just made the decision to deplane 
And now John is renting a car and we are going to drive home. Good decision to be determined. <laughs> All right, so we got our Nissan Murano, five guys. John, how are you feeling? How are you feeling, John? I'm feeling pretty, uh, feel great, feel great. Okay. Honestly. I well, like this. By the time we get to Minneapolis, which is in four hours, the blizzard is gonna lessen and all of your feedback is gonna be incorrect. We will be home pulling into our driveways four hours and 30 minutes from now. Quick stop at Mickey D's and we're sort of half back on the road. Fully. We have only been driving for five minutes, so we still have like three hours and 55 minutes or so left. I don't know what all you guys are talking about. It's beautiful here. <laughs> Good news, everyone. The flight from Fargo to Minneapolis was canceled. We would have been stuck anyway. We made the right decision. So a little update. We decided to drive and you guys were right. It got worse. It was a slow go. Slow go, but that's that's what it takes. Got to drive slow. <laughs> All right. At the time, as you can tell, we made it. But at the time, I had a choice in Fargo. I could have rented this big SUV, you know, a four-wheel drive for $200 or a small SUV for $150. And of course, with our lives on the line, I chose to save 50 bucks. But you kind of know how this goes. On Instagram, while he's recording, posting videos, and now he like, it's hitting me. He does that for a career. Anyways, I don't know how he did that. But on, on Instagram, when you, when you post these things, people can respond. And, and people were saying things like, don't come. You don't understand how bad it is. This is the worst storm that we've ever seen. And the closer we got, as you could tell, the more the storm started to pick up. Okay, I don't condone any of this behavior at all, but as we were driving, the tension in the car reached a fever pitch. We, we fought over whether we should pull over or continue, where to turn, how to proceed forward. My coworker, Nate, was so scared and so mad. He was saying things like, this is the dumbest thing we're ever gonna do. We're not gonna make it. We're going to die, which was not helping anyone in the moment. Eventually, I yelled at him to shut up like he was my toddler son. But Dave, this other guy um, who was there, he's the dad of four kids, and he was dead asleep. I, I'm not joking, just like <laughs> dead asleep the whole time. Just woke up like, oh, we made it. This is great. Uh, <laughs> but we're driving through, you know, perilous conditions, and eventually we made it as you can tell. And truthfully, I've never been more afraid in a car at one point. Like you saw, we were driving 70 miles an hour with not a drop of snow in sight. The next conditions were worse than anyone could have imagined. And every mile we drove, there was another car in the ditch. The wind was howling. Visibility was non-existent. Again, whether this is courageous or foolish, I'll let you decide, but here's the point. Notice what kind of fruit was being produced in our lives during this crisis. Okay, as you saw TJ, the narrator, he was somehow experiencing joy. <laughs> Dave, my friend, was at peace, the dad of four kids. Nate was anxious and upset. Brad, the guy who was there with the shaved head, was steady and full of self-control. I'm not sure what I was. I was a mix of terrified and anxious, but I was committed. And what got us through what this storm was the steady faithful driving just inch by inch over a long period of time. And today I want to unpack one of the fruits of the spirit and the fruit is faithfulness. Now, what is faithfulness? Faithfulness is to be trustworthy and dependable. It's someone who can be relied on. They, they won't cheat or shortchange you. If they say they're going to do it, they will. But it's more than just being trustworthy or dependable once in a while. No, it's to be trustworthy and dependable over a long period of time. Faithful and steady. I love the phrase pastor and author Eugene Peterson popularized with a book called A Long Obedience. To be a Christ follower is a long obedience in the same direction. That's what faithfulness is like. It's consistent, dependable, trustworthy over a long period of time. Now think back to us driving through that storm and how it applies to our lives. Life, of course, is it's full of storms. There's broken dreams. 
and failing marriages and lost jobs, financial difficulties, wayward children, and yet through it all, to become more like Christ, we must remain faithful and steadfast, determined, committed, not just once in a while, but over a long period of time. By the way, one of the reasons we lack faithfulness at times is because of fear. It's fairly easy to be faithful when life is going well, but when it's not, well, I'll be honest, this is true of me, it's easier to jump ship and just give up, to give way to circumstances because we're too afraid or the way forward is too difficult. And it seems to me that the world is full of unfaithful people. In many ways, some unfaithful people are being celebrated for it. Go ahead, follow your heart. Choose a bunch of different religions or ways. Whatever feels right, give up on the marriage. Whatever feels good to you, sure, abandon the church. For whatever reason, it's never been easier and more celebrated to be unfaithful in today's culture. But God is calling his followers to be faithful over a long period of time. And so the question is, will you stay faithful to God even when life gets difficult, when you don't feel like it, or when you feel afraid? In today's scripture passage, we're going to look at the story of Hezekiah, a man who stayed faithful in the face of extremely difficult circumstances. Now to give some backstory to this uh, scripture passage, there were very few decent kings in Israel and Judah's history. But Hezekiah was actually one of the good ones. Second Kings says this, there was no one like Hezekiah among all the kings of Judah. He was successful really in everything he did. Now, it's not like his life was just a cakewalk. During Hezekiah's reign, the king of Assyria was was taking down cities left and right and entire countries just around Hezekiah and Judah. And eventually, Hezekiah had, or uh, Assyria had conquered the cities directly next to Jerusalem, which was the capital of Judah where Hezekiah at the time was hiding out. And Hezekiah knows that he's next and he's scared. The Assyrian king has him in his crosshairs. And I wonder, is there anything that has you anxious or scared, something that's causing fear in your life, and you're just wondering, what am I supposed to do next? Pay attention to that fear, because fear has a way of causing our faithfulness to waver and getting us off track. Now, Hezekiah responds by sending a message to the king of Assyria that says, listen, I'll pay you whatever money you demand, as long as you stay away from us. In other words, I will do anything to stop this threat and relieve my fear. I mean, who cares about staying faithful? I just want to relieve this fear and better my circumstances. So he gathers all the gold, all the silver, all the money that he can find, and he sends it off to the Assyrians. And he assumes that that'll take care of it and he's got nothing to fear anymore and the Assyrian king will go away. But, but it turns out the bribe wasn't enough to make the Assyrians go away. Now see, again, the Assyrians got Hezekiah and Jerusalem right in their crosshairs and nothing, nothing is gonna stop them now. By the way, that, that's, that's kind of how fear operates. Fear is not content with just making us quiver. Fear wants to completely destroy you. Fear wants to stop you in your tracks, prevent you from moving forward and keep all of us from living life the way that God intended us to live. But even with the Assyrians about to overtake Jerusalem, God supplied Hezekiah with just enough courage to withstand the threat, to hold his ground and stay faithful to God's promises. Eventually, scripture says, an angel of the Lord came by and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers and they went packing. Now, at some point in life, every person, every person here or online will be met with a circumstance so trying 
that you'll wonder, how could I possibly remain faithful to God in the midst of this circumstance? So again, the question, will you stay faithful to God despite the fear, despite the circumstance? Based on the life of Hezekiah, I wanna show you two ways that we're all gonna need to stay faithful even when we don't feel like it. And the first is this, we're gonna have to remain faithful in the face of culture and a changing culture. Back then, culture had become a hodgepodge of worshiping really whatever God was most convenient. So in some of Hezekiah's first acts as kings, as king, it says this, that Hezekiah removed the pagan shrines and smashed the sacred pillars. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. In other words, they had been worshiping all different kinds of gods and Hezekiah had the courage to go against culture, to live counterculturally and to bring his people back to worship God alone. Now, just so we're clear on definitions, culture is defined as this. If we have that slide, it's the predominant set of shared practices, beliefs, or values. It's kind of what the general culture holds as truth. Today's culture is not much different than Hezekiah's when it comes to religious beliefs. Culture says, worship whatever God you want as long as you don't stand for just one God. Faithfulness to one God isn't celebrated. It seems most would agree that culture seems to be drifting away from Christ-centered values. So more than ever, it's gonna require courage to stay faithful to Christ and to live counterculturally in the world today. A few years ago, I received an email from the president of an organization called the Timothy Initiative. The Timothy Initiative is this organization that has planted thousands of churches across the world. But specifically, the email was about the hundreds of churches that they'd planted in the country of Nepal. And in this email, he asked people to pray for Nepal because there had been a law that had gone into effect that made it illegal illegal for someone to talk to others about Christianity. I mean, for those Nepalese Christians, can you imagine the faithfulness needed to live out your faith when it's punishable by imprisonment or worse, just by by talking to someone else about our faith? Now, certainly Americans have it much easier than our friends in Nepal, but increasingly, Everyone agrees it's becoming more and more controversial to endorse biblical truth. And if you do, someone will scream, well, that's intolerant. Take a stand on any number of Christian values and people will scream intolerance. And of course, this argument collapses on itself. To call someone intolerant for holding firm in their Christian belief is also intolerant. You can see how the argument breaks down. But that's why more than ever, we need God to give us this fruit of the spirit, faithfulness, a long obedience in the same direction, even when the culture is screaming to do the opposite and head the other way. In fact, this was foundational to Hezekiah's success. Chapter 18, verses six and seven from 2 Kings, it says, Hezekiah, he remained faithful to the Lord faithful to the Lord, and just, just a couple things, right? Just the things he, he really wanted to be faithful. No, it says he remained faithful to the Lord in everything. And he carefully obeyed all the commands of the Lord. And so because of that, the Lord was with him. Will you remain faithful to God even in the face of cultural pressure to do the opposite? Now, the good news for us as Christ followers is that Christians have historically flourished when forced to live counterculturally. We have generations of proof that people, when forced to live opposite the way of culture, the Christian faith has actually thrived. See, the early church in the first centuries experienced tremendous oppression because of their belief in Jesus, that Jesus was the son of God and that he rose from the dead. 
You weren't supposed to believe that. You weren't supposed to make this dead and now resurrected guy, Jesus, the Lord and Savior of your life. That was supposed to be Caesar in Roman culture. And so when Christians did this, it was going against popular culture. But despite the cultural oppression, Christianity from those early centuries grew from a few dozen to a few hundred. And and then by the third century to several million. How does that happen? Historian Rodney Stark writes, one of the primary reasons that Christianity grew so rapidly was because of this, that Christians cared for the sick, the widows and the orphans. They welcomed strangers. They took in outsiders and respected women who were considered second-class citizens. Ironically, every single one of these things was counter-cultural. It wasn't favored to care for the sick. You were supposed to avoid sickness, avoid plagues, but Christians dove in. You weren't supposed to care for widows and orphans. They were supposed to be discarded by society and culture. You weren't supposed to care for women. They were second-class citizens, but Christians, because of the teachings of Jesus, went against culture. See, at the time, the, the dominant cultural belief was that all of those people that I listed were worthless. But Jesus, see, Jesus taught his followers that every person, every person is created in the image of God. Every person has value, worth, and significance before God. And so Christians who loved and cared for these people groups were living truly counterculturally. And that's a big reason why Christianity grew. People, see, people were attracted to something different. Once you peeled back those layers, there was proof, there was something different, something that they wanted that was, that was better. That's why I'm convinced the way forward for us as Christ followers is, is not to withdraw from or ignore or even fight against culture. No, instead, the way forward is to live more like Christ and to worship God with more passion and more faithfulness, a long obedience in the same direction. When you do, when, when we live counterculturally, I'm convinced that people will be drawn to Jesus because his way of life is just better. Now, what can this look like practically? It means, it means that we do whatever it takes to put God first in every area of our lives. Culture screams to spend whatever you want, whenever you want, as long as it makes you happy. But God says to, to give to him first, to ask him how he wants you to spend his money. We are stewards of the gifts he's given us. Let's be faithful over a long period of time with our finances Culture screams to chase every adventure and every feel-good moment. And I love those things too. But God says, stay close to me. Follow me. Create space for me. Ask me before deciding what to do next. Culture says to get your kid involved in any and every activity and make sure they become the next NBA superstar. And I love kids' activities, I love kids' sports, but God says, let's raise up our children to love and follow me. See, God is looking for people who will remain faithful even in the face of culture. Will you allow God to produce consistent, determined, steadfast faithfulness in your life? Second, way that we can remain faithful is to remain faithful in the face of fear. Now, the Assyrians had Hezekiah's people completely trapped, as we've talked about. To top it off, they stood on this wall that surrounded Jerusalem and started talking trash to stoke more fear in the people. The Assyrians, uh, king's chief of staff, yelled this from the wall. He said to the people, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He will never be able to rescue you from my power. Don't let him fool you into trusting the Lord. And he goes on to say, we've conquered every other city that we've come across. What makes you think, Hezekiah's people, that you're gonna be safe? 
He says even our weakest soldiers, our weakest armies will easily defeat your measly troops. He said it's going to get so bad for people that eventually they will be so hungry and thirsty they will eat their own dung and drink their own urine. You gotta love biblical trash talk, okay? At, at any point, in this point in the story, the Assyrians are gonna invade their homes and potentially kill their families, their friends, and their neighbors. Can you imagine the fear? I mean, every day, every night, you're left wondering, is this the day it all ends? It's hard to remain faithful in the midst of that kind of fear. Psychologists have determined that humans are really only born with two fears. We're born naturally with the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. So every other fear and phobia uh, is learned or picked up along the way. And here are some just for fun that I looked up that people have, do we have a slide of those potentially? Maybe not. I'll just list them. But they have a fear of spiders, which is arachnophobia. There's a fear of cats, which is allurophobia. Anyone afraid of cats? There's a fear of having cell phone contact. It's called nomophobia. There's cholerophobia, which is the fear of clowns. Anyone afraid of clowns? They're terrifying in some ways. Or there's pogonophobia, which is the fear of beards. Okay, I must have that because I can't grow a beard, unfortunately. I'm like 39, I still can't grow a beard, it's embarrassing. But all of these fears, other than the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises, have been learned along the way. And so that tells me something. If, if a fear has been learned, that means it can be unlearned. But of course, you, you know as well as I do, it's not just easy to, to forget or unlearn something. That's why we need to replace that fear with something else. We need to replace that fear with, with a source of trust, something that we can anchor into, someone that, that we can consider reliable and strong, something that we can put our trust in. The Syrian's chief of staff asked, what are you trusting in? What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? He goes on to say, are you trusting in Egypt? Now, Egypt was a potential ally that Hezekiah could have called upon for help. But then he says, but perhaps you will say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God. What makes you think that the Lord can rescue Jerusalem? What makes you think that the Lord can rescue any one of us? That's a good question that we all must answer. Because I wonder, do you trust that the Lord your God is faithful? Do you? Do I trust in God's faithfulness? Now, thankfully, Hezekiah continued to trust God's faithfulness, and God eventually saved him and his people from destruction. Now, I was thinking about all the times that I've felt real fear and how hard it is, how difficult it is to trust in the faithfulness of God in the face of such fear. My first semester in college, 20 years ago, and extremely homesick, moving from Washington State to California, worried that I was gonna find friends or do well in school or just ever feel like I belonged. I was terrified the day that I brought my first kid home from the hospital and thinking, what in the world am I supposed to do with this thing? A few decades ago, I felt immense fear when my older brother was suicidal. And I was nine or 10 years old and just every day worried that that was gonna be the day that his life ended. And it was in those moments, and perhaps you can recall some of these moments where real fear emerges in you, but it was in those moments that I had to ask myself, who do I trust? Will I give in to my fear or will I trust God? Do I believe the promise that says the Lord is trustworthy in all he promises? And he's faithful in all he does. Each one of those times that we experience that kind of fear, fortunately, God gave me just enough courage to endure. How? By trusting, by trusting that God was gonna be faithful. And so next time you're experiencing fear, I wanna urge you 
to trust him. Maybe to memorize Psalm 145, 13, the Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. I know it's not easy. It's not easy to trust him, but we must hold firm to the promises of God and his word. To not give in to the voice of fear, to trust the faithfulness of God, to really trust him. Now, the frustrating thing is that even when we do trust God, it won't necessarily change the outcome, but I believe to my core, it will change how we're able to handle the outcome. Um, Just to share another story from the Timothy Initiative, I recently read a a story that they, they shared with us just a couple weeks ago about this guy named Tenjin. Now, Tenjin grew up Buddhist, but a church planter shared the gospel with him and the stories of Jesus with him over a long period of time. And Tenjin finally gave his life to Christ in April of 2022. But then he wrote these words on December 11th to our church. He said, on December 11th, I was at church in in, uh, Nepal. We had just finished singing some worship songs when my father stormed in. As a devout Buddhist, he was in a rage that I was following Jesus. He grabbed me and dragged me out of the church and began beating me with a belt. Thankfully, people in our church took care of me by bringing medicine and food. And it's hard to relate to that kind of persecution, that kind of experiences in our context. But what I want you to notice and the way that these stories can inspire us is the way that Tenjin responded in the face of such fear. He wrote this, even through the persecution from my father, I'm continuing to follow Jesus. I am staying firm in my faith and continuing to tell my neighbors and family the gospel. Please pray that my father and the rest of my family will believe in Jesus also. Tenjin was staying firm. He was remaining faithful. And when I think about the kind of faithfulness that Tenjin has has in the midst of such fear, the words of King David come to mind from Psalm 23. He said, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Do you believe that today? That God is with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, God is comforting David. God is comforting Tenjin. And and he's comforting all of you. See, the reason that any one of us can remain faithful to God is because first and foremost, he is faithful to us. Supplying us with just enough courage to face another day, to stand up again, to move forward in the midst of difficult circumstances, to remain faithful over a long period of time. And I wonder what kind of dark valleys you might be experiencing. And I know when it's dark and it's hard to see in the face of an ever changing culture, in the In the midst of fear, it's not easy to feel God's presence. But I want you to hear me that God is with you. His rod and his staff will comfort you. Trust him. Lean on him. Remain faithful to him even even when you're afraid. Let me pray for everyone here. Heavenly Father, As we come to the conclusion of today, it strikes me that that so much of what we're talking about is the things we can do to remain faithful. And I'm just so grateful for all the people who have been following Christ over a long period of time, people who have gone before us to show us the way, grateful for their faithfulness. And I'm grateful for those who are just beginning this journey to, to learn what it means to be faithful to you. But what strikes me is that ultimately, Our faithfulness is dependent on how much we trust in your faithfulness. God, you never change. You endure. You remain faithful and steadfast. And so today as we leave, rather than beating ourselves up over the times that we've fallen short or the times that we haven't remained faithful to you, God, I pray instead you would just gently remind us to turn to you, to follow your spirit, 
to remind ourselves of all the ways that you have been so faithful and good, even in the midst of trying circumstances, God. Help us to keep our eyes on you, to remember your goodness and your faithfulness. And then as we do that, I pray, God, that 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 spirit of faithfulness would grow in all of us and that we would learn how to remain faithful to you in the midst of culture and in the face of fear. We love you, God, and we're grateful for a day to worship you. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen.